Before you watch this video, I have to warn you about some of the graphics and the gruesome stories. I don't know how to describe some of the things that Ronnie did to people. And this is just an incomplete story of him. On paper, it seems he had a completely normal childhood. How does someone like that grow up to become a murderer, a killer? He was born on August 23, 1943 in San Antonio, Texas. He was still a child when he moved to Mexico along with his family, but since his father left the family, the mom, Anna Maria, decided to move to LA when Rodney was only 12. Rodney then joined the army five years later when he was 17 years old and he served as a clerk. But four years later, after what was described as a nervous breakdown, he was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder by a military psychiatrist and discharged on medical grounds. Other diagnoses later proposed by various psychiatric experts at his trials included narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder. He was also diagnosed with psychopathy and sexual sadism comorbidities which I had no idea what that was, no clue at all until I searched it up, and it basically means that he gets aroused by seeing people suffer, which um, kind of makes sense because he did cause a lot of suffering to his victims. For example, he would choke them out until they were unconscious, then he would wait for them to come back, and then choke them again and repeat the process over and over again. I can't help but wonder what turned Ronnie this way. Did the military have something to do with it with almost four years of him serving as a clerk? Or maybe this disorder kind of came out of nowhere. Maybe Ronnie was always a monster. Anyways, let's just continue with the story. So after the army, Rodney enrolled in school, UCLA School of Fine Arts. This is where he earned his Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in 1968. But this is also the same year that he kidnapped, raped, beat, and tried to kill his first known victim. Her name was Tally Shapiro. She was only eight years old and she was on her way to school when Rodney lured her into the car. It was also that same year that Tally's family had lost their house to a fire. So they were living in a Sunset Boulevard hotel in Hollywood in 1968. So Tally had to walk to school because the school bus wouldn't pick her up at the hotel. And she was also very scared of public transportation, which is how Rodney was able to spot her as she was on her way to school. He told her that he had a very nice painting to show her. And Tally, being the smart little girl, told him that she was not allowed to speak to strangers. But Rodney, being sneaky, had told her that he knew her family, so it was totally fine if she got in the car with him so that he can show her this picture. Tally knew the minute she got in the car that it was a huge mistake. She said she wanted to escape from the car, but she just didn't know how because she was so small. According to Bailey Breeze, the moment that Celia stepped into Rodney's car, there was someone who was looking at them and found the whole situation very suspect. He found a little girl going inside a random guy's car which was just so weird. So he followed Ronnie to Ronnie's apartment. By the time he got there, Ronnie had already done a lot of damage to Tally. The guy that saw this and was knocking out the door, he was an ex-police officer for LA. His name was Chris Camacho. He testified about interrupting Rodney's rape of Tally on September 25, 1968. Chris knocked on the door and heard a voice of a man respond in a very excited and weird way. And he threatened to break down the door if the man did not open it because he knew whatever was going on in there was not good. 
Rodney told Chris that he was naked because he had just came out the shower, so he couldn't open the door. When he didn't open up the door, Chris kicked the door and saw Tally on the floor. She had a metal bar on her neck. She was unconscious and spread eagled with massive amounts of blood around her. At this point, Rodney escaped through a back door and he fled the state. Chris said that he thought Tally was dead because she was not breathing. Seeing Tally that way was something he'd never seen before. He hugged Tally afterward, telling her, Remember what I said. The best revenge is living well. Chris had no idea who this man was who raped Tally, who beat her up, who kidnapped her. But because he was in the apartment, he found Ronnie's student ID, and LAPD spoke to neighbors who also knew him as Rodney. Detective Steve Hodel determined Ronnie as the main suspect in the attack of Tally. During this time, Ronnie flew to New York. He was accepted to New York University School of Arts under his new name, John Berger. While taking classes in NYU, he was also hired as an arts and drama counselor at a summer camp in George Mills, New Hampshire under the name John Berger. The summer of 1971, John Berger, aka Rodney, graduated from NYU and began his third summer working at the arts and drama camp in George Mills. During this time, he was also working as a photographer, mostly focusing on young women in Manhattan. It was the same summer that the body of Cornelia Michael Crilly was found in her apartment in Yorkville area of Manhattan, New York. She was 23 years old. Meanwhile, in California, the FBI met with Detective Fodell and decided that Rami should be added to the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list in an attempt to locate him three years after tracking Tally. Towards the end of summer, two campers from George Mills recognized their counselor, John Berger, aka Rodney, on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted Fugitives list because it was posted at their local post office. The camp director confirmed the man listed as Rami Alcala as his employee John Berger and he caused the FBI. The FBI agents arrived to the camp and arrest Rodney. Rodney was taken back to California. By this time, Tally and her family had moved to Mexico, and they refused to allow her to testify at Ronnie's trial, which means they were unable to convict him of rape and attempted murder without any primary witness. Prosecutors were forced to allow Ronnie to plead guilty to a lesser charge of assault. Ronnie was released in 1974, but less than two months of his release, he was rearrested after assaulting a 13-year-old girl, Julie J. Rodney had tricked her into thinking that he was going to take her to school. Rodney forced Julie to smoke weed with him. They were found by a park ranger who smelled the weed. He was sent to prison and served two years. In 1977, after Rodney's second release, his parole officer in L.A took the unusual step of allowing him to go to New York. This was a terrible mistake. That same week, Ellen Jane Hilver, 23, went missing. No one linked her disappearance with Ronnie's arrival, and he went back to California. Almost a year later, they found Ellen Jane's bones under Rockefeller Estate in Westchester County. This was Ronnie's favorite place to take pictures. Ellen Jane has a cousin who wrote a blog about her. In her blog, she says that they drifted apart, but she knew that Ellen had just broken up with her boyfriend and she went on a date with a stranger. After that date, she was never found again. Investigators now believe that a week after arriving in Manhattan, 
Ronnie killed Alan Jane. When he arrived in California, a lot of strange disappearances and killing happened to women. November 1977, the body of Jill Barcombe, 18 year old female, was found in Hollywood Hills. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled with a pair of blue pants. A month later, the body of Georgia Wickstead, 27 year old female, was found in her apartment in Malibu. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled as well. During this time, Ronnie was working as a typesetter at the LA Times. Here he shared a lot of his photography work with his co-workers. They said that at the time they should have reported him because he had a lot of nudity within teenage boys and young women, which he said that their parents had asked him to take these photos. June 24, 1978, the body of an unidentified white female was found in the laundry room. A few days later, a police officer from Santa Monica, California, received a call reporting a missing woman. A couple weeks after that, the body was found. September of 1978, Rodney was chosen to participate as a bachelor in a show called Dating Game. This was an ABC television game show. Ronnie was a convicted rapist and a registered sex offender, which, honestly, he should have never been allowed to participate in this show. They introduced Rodney as a photographer. There were three bachelors, and Rodney was the first bachelor. There was one woman who they were all competing for. Her name was Cheryl Bradshaw, and she chose him for a date. Here's a video of this episode. I am serving you for dinner. Oh. <laughs> what are you called and what do you look like? I'm called the banana and I look really good. <laughs> bachelor number one, bachelor number two, or bachelor number three. Who gets the dates? Well, I like bananas, so I'll take one. Number one, bachelor number one. All right. During this time, Ronnie was on a killing spree. Lucky for her, after the show, she found him to be too creepy and refused to go out with him. Unfortunately, Ronnie continued to kill and kill and kill. This video is already very long and it would be even longer if I mentioned all of the killing he did after. One of his victims actually ran away because she was clever enough into tricking him. Over the years, even his siblings got involved with his, his case and, and tried to defend him. The FBI leaked his photos online, hoping that some of the relatives of these females and males would come forward and say, hey, that's my, that's my mom, or that's my sister, or that's my brother. Because a lot of the times, these people were linked as runaways when they could have just been killed by Rodney. As the years went by, Rodney was found guilty of many, many murders. Many, many dead bodies were found, and he took the blame for them. The latest one was just last year.